Is it a leadership issue with Republicans or are House Republicans incapable of being led? Uh, I think the answer is yes. I mean, to put it in a parlance, I think that Mr. Johnson would understand. Um, he's like the pastor that finally gets to take the pulpit, like when everybody's on spring break, right? Like he's really excited. But then if he had to do it on a regular Sunday, like he ain't up to the job. He's not up to this job either. He was a backbencher, right? Nobody would ever heard of him. And now he's sitting in the big chair and he can't figure out how to do any of this stuff. Right. Like I'm sure Kevin McCarthy is smoking a cigar, drinking a glass of wine somewhere, just laughing his tail off at all of this. And I think that to lose twice in one day just speaks to a dysfunction that that one that one member, Eli Crane, whoever the heck he is. Right. Like that's what they want. And you talk about leadership. This happened because Donald Trump wanted it to happen. And remember that they are responsible for all of this stuff based on the fact that they have not, will not, and haven't ever stood up to them. And as I've said before, Stephanie, we got a long way to go, but this is the kind of stuff that's going to cost Republicans dearly in the fall. Because if there's two things you know, voters really care about, one is competence. They want their government to be competent, even if they don't really like it. And the thing they like least is corruption. And that's what these guys have in spades. Donald Trump is the epitome of incompetence and the epitome of corruption all in one. And so what we saw this week shouldn't surprise any of us. It was always going to come this way. Well, Reid laid it out for Democrats if they're watching. Do you believe, Maria, there's a way for Democrats to capitalize on this dysfunction? Yes. <laughs> yeah, in a word, yes. Yes. Well, look, I mean, the fact that this, what did he say? He said, I don't care about basic governance. Then you're in the wrong job because your job is literally to govern and to actually make laws and to actually make the American people feel like someone is taking care of them because that's why they voted for you. But I think the challenge with the Democrats is that they have swaggered. They actually have all this legislation. We actually have a, you know, Biden bounce on the economy and no one's owning it. They got to get their groove on. Yes, they do. Because you know who's not really into them right now? On the, uh, when it comes to the Republicans, the folks in Nevada, right? What we saw today with Nikki Haley, like they are very clear that who they want on the Republican side to govern is Donald Trump. And Donald Trump led us down a rabbit hole of mess. Why do the American people want that? Because they're not being reminded of what happened under Donald Trump. But what they can't do is be reminded what happened when a multicultural America came out and voted and they brought in Biden and they are now in a place where they can actually see results of that vote. But they actually have to, the Democrats really have to own it and they have to have that swagger. Reed, uh, Maria brought it up. Nikki Haley is fresh off an embarrassing loss, right? Her loss to none of these candidates in Nevada. Not a good look. However, she came out swinging with some pretty strong statements. And watch how she's spinning it. Look at what happened yesterday. Republicans lost a bill on the border. Republicans lost a bill on supporting Israel. The RNC chair lost her job. Donald Trump was found that he's not immune from any of the charges that are coming up. It is total chaos. Reed, Chuck Todd wrote today that Donald Trump is the number one reason for political dysfunction in the House. But what do you make of Nikki Haley finding her swagger and calling it out? Uh, well, I will say this. Uh, Ambassador Haley just cut about 72 Lincoln Project ads that will run about six million times in the course of the next nine months. But what I would say this is, too, is that, look, she's understood now what it feels like, which is she, unlike her you know, home state senator, Tim Scott, is not up for ritual humiliation. She's going to go out. She's going to go out swinging. And so I'll say this. Like, I think we need to impart a little bit of three dimensional chess here, gang. Right. OK, she's not going to be the nominee. Fine. Right. But here's what I can tell you. The longer she's in the race saying stuff like she said after Nevada, the better for the country, because there are a whole bunch of Republicans that we saw in Iowa, that we saw in Nevada. And look, 31 percent, 30. Trump can't afford to lose half of that. He can't afford to lose a third of that. He can't afford to lose 20 percent of that when it comes to Republicans. And so every day she's out there saying this, there are more and more Republicans and I think I've said this to you before, Stephanie, who see Nikki as someone they used to support, 
a Mitt Romney, a John McCain, a George W. Bush. That's the party they want back. And so, yes, is Donald Trump the owner of the GOP? He is, but it is smaller. It is older. It is whiter. It is nuttier. Right. And there are a whole bunch of Republicans like I used to be, Stephanie, who say, I really don't want this anymore. And so she should stay out there as long as she can, as long as she wants to. It's not about winning the nomination. It's about Donald Trump having to come, as Maria said, with defense on the left as the president and Democrats should be beating the heck out of him, while Nikki Haley's over here on his right dinging him on losing a step, being unhinged, blowing up the debt, all of this stuff. Like, this is prime time for us, guys. we got a real chance here. Maria, President Biden is very clearly trying to get something done on the border right now. But from a narrative perspective, are things too late because when you think about the last three years and how much Republicans have been beating on this over and over, even I live in blue New York City yep. and people are talking about the migrant crisis all the time. If you watch local news in New York, every other story is about this. Well, I think this is where the, the Democrats, and I would encourage the president to really think about what is happening at the border is not immigration policy. By the time someone shows up at the border, there is no resource for them. And what the president did so effectively around Ukraine, he explained to the American people what the problem was, why it was a national security issue. He framed it for the American people. He has not but done that. But he was that. talking about Ukraine right. from the beginning. From the beginning. But what he has not done is he has not explained the complexity of what we're facing at the border. Because it's not just Venezuelans. We're seeing an influx of Chinese. We're seeing an influx of Indians, Haitians. of Haitians. and stuff. Why are they coming? And why is it all of a sudden just our issue? It's a Western hemispheric issue. We need to bring in Canada. We need to bring in Colombia, who's absorbed close to 2 million Venezuelans. We need to reframe it and say, look, part of the challenge that we have right now is that for the last 45 years, we have not had a Latin American policy. But guess who has been paying attention to Latin America for the last 45 years? Russia and China. What do they have that they are actually, you know, how are they involved in the crisis of the border? And how do we reframe that as a national security issue? Because I deeply believe it is. And at the same time, how do we remind people that the Gang of Eight was all about the undocumented people that have been here for the last 20, 30 years, who have roughly 16 million American children on the sidelines ready to vote if the president addresses their needs?